Nicole Dunch. I am the Community Outreach and Engagement Director here at Georgetown Living. Today we're going to be speaking about advanced dementia and hospice. I'm going to be covering the advanced dementia portion and Bibi is going to be introducing herself and covering the hospice section later on. We are a certified Alzheimer's facility here in Georgetown. Our community has a range of dementia from early stage to advanced stage. We're unique in that our family has founded other home care companies that can deliver services both into private homes and into our community. This includes private in-home care through the Helper Bees, which uses personality to match families with great caregivers. Georgetown Living Home Health, which provides nursing, physical, and occupational therapy paid for by Medicare, and our Medicare accredited hospice, Tranquility Hospice, which Bibi will speak more about. These additional services help us provide thorough care for our residents, no matter what stage or type of dementia they might have. This is an important point as not all facilities cater to all stages of life. For example, some facilities will no longer be able to provide care if you can no longer bear weight to assist with the transfer. This is not the case with us, and our caregivers are fully trained to assist your loved one from early stage to advanced stage care needs. On average, a person lives four to eight years after a dementia diagnosis. Often, de dementia begins in the brain years before the actual diagnosis. Our brains are so powerful and complex, individuals are often able to compensate for lost skills and abilities in the beginning. This is called cognitive reserve, and I'll go ahead and give you a quick overview on how dementia progresses from early to middle to end stage. The early stage is often when you find someone having trouble coming up with a word or a name Maybe they're misplacing or losing things and having trouble planning. The early stage is a good time to start looking into in-home care options, even if it's just for a couple hours a day. So you can go out, go to the doctor, get groceries, and get those important errands done. This is also the time to start touring facilities should you need placement later on down the road. Decide on a number one choice and a backup just in case your number one choice is full and you are in need of a quick placement. Touring facilities and gathering all of the information is time consuming and you don't want to be worrying about that while dealing with the emotional stress of placing your loved one. There are also some excellent respite options in the area and they provide caregivers a much needed break 
and help promote socialization. Middle stage is when individuals start to need more advanced care. This is often difficult for families to understand as loved ones refused routine hygiene habits, maybe such as bathing or brushing teeth that once were very important to them. Family also might notice accidents, sleeping pattern changes, and behavioral changes, such as depression or anger. Starting a routine can be very, very beneficial at this stage. Our days at Georgetown Living are very structured, and this helps our residents know what to expect throughout the day. At this point in the middle stage, an individual is needing about six to eight hours of in-home care if they're not already in a facility. Late stage dementia symptoms are normally severe. Likely your loved one will already be in a facility at this point, or if they're at home, they will need full-time care. And this is what we are gonna to be touching on today. As different dementias progress, different types might have different symptoms earlier on, but as individuals get to the advanced dementia, the symptoms presented are very similar. A significant amount of care is required for someone experiencing the advanced stage of dementia. A person will have trouble eating, swallowing, need full assistance with activities of daily living, and will need full-time care. This is why a facility that specializes in memory care can be such a big benefit during these times. Not only for the care and knowledge they will be able to provide your loved one, but also for the opportunity to connect with other family members that are going through a similar process. At Georgetown Living, I run a support group for members of the community who have loved ones with dementia. We have past and present family members that, that attend, and it's incredibly helpful for families to have the support and guidance as their loved one's dementia progresses. We work very hard at maintaining quality of life, even when someone is at the end stages of dementia. All right, signs and symptoms, physical. So the first one we are gonna talk about is loss of motion. As someone progresses in their dementia, there are several negative possibilities that can be associated with lack of motion. The first one is an increased fall risk. Uh, falls have a significant impact on caregiver stress, uh, financial uh, stability. Cognitive changes also increase the risk of falls. Maybe the floor looks like there's a hole in it. Seeing a chair to sit in when there really isn't one. Certain dementias like Parkinson's can cause the individual to slowly become more rigid and lose the control over their ability to move their limbs. And that also results in an increased likelihood of falls. The loss of independence associated with lack of motion, um, just being able to get up and complete basic tasks such as feeding oneself or going to the bathroom unassisted. The loss of movement can also result in pressure sores. Even with frequent, frequent repositioning, we know individuals with advanced dementia lack the ability to consume adequate nutrition and that results in poor skin integrity and can lead to pressure sores. Someone who is in the advanced stage of dementia will likely be incontinent of bowel and bladder, and this can also lead to skin integrity issues such as UTIs, skin breakdown, even with a regular toileting and changing schedule. ADL assistance. All assistance is needed with activities of daily living. This includes routine care that we may not even think about, such as getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, getting dressed, getting a glass of water. This is where the routine ADL care of a facility is so beneficial. It could be strenuous trying to lift and assist an individual with advanced dementia at home. Infections are also common with advanced dementia. Their body may not be strong enough to fight off an infection, even with the help of antibiotics. We see repeated UTIs, aspiration pneumonia, um, those type of things. A poor swallow also, a poor swallow leads to increased risk of aspiration pneumonia. As someone declines, the ability to swallow is diminished, 
resulting in food or fluids being allowed into the lungs. This results in aspiration pneumonia. A pureed diet and thickened fluids are often used in response to a poor swallow. While these modifications usually help for a period of time, they are not a fix for the swallow issue. It's normal to see someone less motivated or fatiguing early while eating and drinking due to swallow issues. Signs and symptoms behavioral. Often physical decline will go hand in hand with behavioral decline, but there are situations when it doesn't. We've had residents who are physically in good health, but have severe behavioral issues. First one is anger. When someone becomes upset or angry, we try to look for the root of the issue. Maybe they're hungry, thirsty, tired. Maybe a change of face is needed or a change of environment. Possibly it's too much stimulation. Maybe the TV is too loud or the radio is too loud. It's always important to assess for pain or possible infection that might be contributing to anger. We know when individuals lose the ability to communicate as dementia progresses and aren't always able to convey their pain. Unfortunately, depression and dementia go hand in hand. According to the Alzheimer's Society, around 40% of people with Alzheimer's suffer from depression as well. Scheduling an appointment with your primary care doctor is recommended if you think your loved one has depression. The doctor will do a thorough workup and recommend treatment options. For some who are in the earlier to middle stages, an appointment with a geriatric psychiatrist who is familiar with dementia can be beneficial. At Georgetown Living, we recognize the likelihood of depression with dementia and encourage outdoor time as much as possible. We like to go on nature walks, watch the birds, and of course gardening is always a favorite. We encourage res residents to participate in activities as much as possible to decrease isolation. Another one, another common symptom of advanced dementia are hallucinations, delusions, and illusions. Hallucinations are defined as hearing or seeing things that are not really there. An example of a hallucination is maybe seeing a cat walking along the backside of a couch. Delusions are defined as fixed false beliefs or ideas that an individuals have. For example, a delusion is when a loved one gets accused of stealing from someone that has dementia. An illusion is an object that is viewed as something else. This might be a chair that someone sees as a toilet, a dark bathroom mat by the tub that looks like a hole in the ground, or maybe a coat rack that looks like a person standing in the corner. Lewy body dementia is where we see uh, often severe and unpredictable hallucinations. We always try to rule out infection if hallucinations are new or changing with someone with advanced dementia that is experiencing a distressing hallucination, we always routinely call in hospice or the primary care to rule out infection or to thoroughly go over medications and see what we might need to be changed. As dementia progresses, symptoms will change and with that we know medications will likely need to be changed as well. Sleep issues are another thing we see in advanced dementia. As it progresses, Sleep issues are likely to appear. Some might start sleeping more frequently throughout the day, while others might start sound sundowning in the evening and have a hard time falling asleep. We try to combat sleep issues with routine and structure. We avoid, uh, you know, extra coffee at night, um, extra sweets, things like that. We also try to use mental and physical stimulation. If we know someone is having a hard time staying awake throughout the day, um, we'll structure activities for them and try to keep them up. If you do have an individual at home who is still able to ambulate and likes to get up and wander at night, make sure you have the appropriate safety measures in place, such as baby locks on the cabinets, knives, sharp objects, and medications all locked up or put up high away. Someone with advanced dementia loses the ability to verbalize. This can make it challenging for family members to communicate and connect. There are still meaningful moments and interactions to be had. Advanced dementia doesn't mean the end of interacting with the individual. 
There are many appropriate in-stage activities both you and your loved one can enjoy together. Gentle hand massages, um, favorite music, maybe reading a favorite book, picture albums, going through picture albums from childhood, or just reminiscing about favorite family memories. Emergencies, hospice versus hospital. Comfort is routinely the number one concern with advanced dementia, and hospitals don't always go hand in hand with comfort. It's well known that people with dementia often have other comorbidities that might lead to poorer hospitalization outcomes. Taking someone out of their routine environment to be admitted to the hospital can be upsetting and confusing for the individual. Hospice allows for quality symptom management, all within the comfort of their own home or own environment. In my experience, um, when someone falls and they're on hospice, you know, we get immediate care right away. We're able to pick up a phone, get on uh, the line right away with the nurse. The nurse comes out and assesses. Pain, me pain medication is called in if it's needed uh, versus not being on hospice. And that's being sent out to the hospital, and the hospital has their own uh, procedures and routines and uh, things that they need to do once the individual gets there. And I will go ahead and let BB talk a little bit more about that and Tranquility Hospice. Hello, my name is BB Bartell, and I am with Tranquility Hospice Care. Thank you so much for tuning in in this unique symposium. I'm really excited to spend a little bit of time with you all today. And I, of course, want to thank Nicole for doing such a great job going over advanced dementia and Alzheimer's and what to expect. And this is a nice segue into what I'll be going over. So to give you an overview, overview I'll be touching on the risks and complications of advanced dementia. Then I'm going to talk about what care options you have at this stage, specifically hospital versus hospice. And I know there's a lot of misconceptions around hospice, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly is hospice. And then I'll end with, should you want to choose hospice, what are the points that you really want to take a look at? Now to be, quote, approved for hospice, there must be a terminal diagnosis. And when it comes to hospice, it's more obvious to associate diseases such as cancer or heart disease to being seen as a terminal illness. So where exactly does Alzheimer's and dementia fit in this? Well, we know that dementia and Alzheimer's are the fifth leading cause of death. In fact, in the UK, it's the number one cause. But we also must understand when it comes to advanced dementia, it's not as intuitive as, say, cancer to be considered a terminal illness. But it, in fact, is. So we know that it's a very serious and progressive condition of the brain. And in dementia and Alzheimer's, again, we know that the brain is affected, and it's obvious to see the direct impacts of that effect on the brain as memory loss and changes in cognition. But we know that the brain is not just responsible for memory and understanding, it also controls our bodily systems, you know, our circulation, our, our breathing, our digestion. So as brain cells are being damaged, it affects communication and memory, yes, but also the whole body. And this is how it le can lead to complications. And Nicole has done a great job on going how these complications can present themselves. And that can be changes in mobility and frailty and other conditions can exacerbate these complications. And you oftentimes see infections. Now Nicole also touched on she frequently sees hospitalization in this group. And that makes sense because if there is a concern such as a pneumonia or a fall, then you want to get care. And the route at this point is oftentimes to go to the hospital to seek treatment. So let's talk a little bit about hospitalization and dementia. When we look at this group, we see that dementia are th patients are three times more likely to go to the hospital. And this approach is what I like to call a reactive approach meaning when a problem or complication arises and we go to the hospital to seek treatment, that's a very reactive approach. And I believe we've all been to the hospital before to know that it's not the most comfortable environment. We get woken up in the middle of the night. Um, if things are severe enough, you can go to the ICU, which increases your risk of developing delirium, especially in this uh, patient population. 
Um, it also puts you in a position of getting non-beneficial treatment, you know, such as those two feed placements, which are extremely uncomfortable. So this, of course, is a, a lot of stress added to the patient, which of course will also add a lot of stress to the family. Now I've been in the ICU, I've worked in the ICU for several years, so I know, you know, to save a patient, we will do all the IV lines, the fluids, the IV antibiotics, and the ventilator to save that patient. Now should that not work, and this leads to death, we must be clear that this death will most likely be in a setting the patient did not wish for. So at this stage, another option presents itself, and that is hospice. Now when we, want, when we compare the hospital versus a hospice approach, we talked about the hospital being a reactive manner. In hospice, I like to consider it a proactive manner. We see the patient very often. Uh, most people don't realize how much nursing care is involved in hospice. It is more th so than any other home-based care that's out there. So we see the patient often, and if we take that example of an infection, if we catch that earlier on, we can treat uh, with by mouth antibiotics, um, and so that can prevent or, or require no hospitalization in that setting. Now there have been numerous studies on hospice across many different diseases, and those on hospice have been shown to have a greater satisfaction during this period of life. And I'm going to save going deeper on this um, a little bit later in my talk, so let's hold on that. But clearly with hospice, um, we see less pain and discomfort. Now, if we specifically talk about advanced dementia, as they become more and more physically inactive, they're spending more time in that chair, spending more time in that bed, and their limbs can what we call contract or tighten almost in a fetal-like position. So it's very important to keep that skin care intact so he or she doesn't experience pain from all that tightness and um, or skin tearing or bed sores they may ha that may happen at this stage. So on hospice, we really monitor for these things to prevent it. And if it does happen, we aggressively treat it so there's no unnecessary discomfort. Hospice clinicians and aides were, were trained to read the patient. So even though they're not verbally communicative, we know the visible signs um, that are crucial to easing that discomfort and pain. And by providing the care of, uh, in the home of the patients, they're less likely to die in the hospital. Now there also has been a study that has been shown again across multiple diseases that those on hospice live longer than those uh, not on hospice. And I really hesitate to mention that because it's not the focus of hospice care. Obviously, quantity is important, but our focus and priority of hospice is also quality of life. And so it's a great benefit to, of course, live longer, but it's a great in the sense that it also comes with an amazing quality of life when you get hospice care. But despite all of these positive things, hospice is vastly underutilized. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there about hospice. So I really wanted to talk about what hospice is and where I wanted to start with was the philosophy of hospice. Now people that go on hospice are very happy to hear that hospice is far more about living than dying. And the services can be provided wherever a patient calls home, whether that's an assisted living facility, a nursing home, or their own home. And it allows a person to live out his or her life on their own terms with peace of mind and respect. We never take away hope. And, and we hear often people say, oh, you're going on hospice? Well, you're giving, you're giving up hope. And that's a lot of pressure to take as an individual. And it simply is not true. We're not giving up hope. We're simply changing and expanding the focus of hope. We can hope for comfort and good symptom management. We can hope for that quality of life and quality time with family. We can hope to have a special holiday, holiday season or you know, attend a grandchild's wedding. So we never take away hope. It's a beautiful thing. Hospice provides care and support in an, an environment that promotes quality. Oftentimes, hospice is brought to the conversation late, so patients don't get the full benef benefit of hospice, and it's a shame. It's often at a time when a physician or a hospital says, 
You know, there's not much more we can do for you. And again, this simply is not true. There may be nothing more that we can do to cure your illness, but you are not your illness. And there is always more we can do for you as a person. The other thing that hospice does is we support families and caregivers. So not just the patient. And I'll touch a little bit more about that um, later in my, in my talk. Hospice is very unique in that we have a comprehensive model of care. And you will hear that hospice is holistic. And what that simply means is that we take the whole person into account. So yes, we are very much physical beings and we focus that on hospice. We, you know, we make sure that skin is intact like we talked about. We address any infect infections or complications that on a physical level arise. But we are not just physical beings. We're spiritual beings. We feel hopelessness. We feel despair. We are social beings. We uh, desire connections and relationships. And sometimes that doesn't go quite as well. And we have conflicts and feelings of isolation. We are also emotional beings. We feel happy. We feel sad. We feel fear. And all of these aspects encompasses us as an individual. And in, and in hospice, it's unique that we take all of that individual and all of that person and we really care for that. So it's what we call a comprehensive model of care. Now, how do we achieve this, you ask? So we do this through our team. And in hospice, it's an interdisciplinary team, which means there are several disciplines or specialties that come together to help coordinate care for that patient. So our team consists of a medical director who is a physician um, and is highly involved in each patient's care. If a family desires to continue the personal physician for that patient, that can absolutely happen. We also have a nurse case manager um, who are highly trained in hospice care and can handle any of the aspects that we went over earlier. For hospice, nursing must be done by a registered nurse so you will get an RN as well as an LVN in some cases. And nurses generally visit around twice a week and this can go up and down based on the family and the patient's wants and their needs. You will also have a hospice aide and their responsibility is to help with activities of daily living. And they visit about three times a week. And again, this can go up and down depending on the wants and needs. So they get the patient up out of the chair, up out of the bed, and go to the shower if possible. If you think about that, that's a lot of movement. That's a lot of mobility. And when you add on nursing visits with aid visits, that's a lot of hands-on care, a lot of touch points weekly. Also on the team is a social worker, and they have a lot of resources on, in their hands, um, whether it be financial planning or end-of-life uh, planning. And they're also highly trained in psychosocial issues. There's also a spiritual counselor on the team. And the social worker and spiritual counselor come about once or twice a month. And again, this can adjust based on uh, the desires of the family. And last but not least, um, some hospice teams, and I can speak to our company, also have a patient representative. And they're there even before you get admitted to hospice, um, when you're thinking about it. They're there on admission, and they're there throughout the care. So they're just another important advocate for the patient and um, the family. So we've mentioned the unique aspect of care is the comprehensive model, and we do so through this interdisciplinary team. But another unique aspect of hospice care that's uh, important to mention is the care that we provide to the family and caregiver. Now, when we provide such a great level of care to the patient, as you can see, it lessens the burden of care on the families and the caregivers. And they feel more at ease and happy to see their loved ones are taken care of so well. We are also there to educate the caregiver on how to nurture and care for their loved one at this stage, but also helping them to adjust and um, to the diminished uh, functionality of their loved one. We also help educate uh, how to read signs and symptoms of discomfort. And when I say caregivers, I mentioned before, this involves family members, but it also uh, we also provide education to caregivers in facilities that are providing care. Hospice provides emotional, social, and spiritual support 
to the patient, but it also provides this to the family and caregivers as well. And I mentioned uh, the social worker uh, gets asked a lot of questions about um, financial planning and resources, and they're very well versed in that. The other thing I want to mention that is the third thing that's unique about hospice is that when the patient does die, hospice care does not stop there. We care at least one year following the death of your loved one, and we are there to support wherever we can or whatever the family needs. Um, I want to quickly mention other benefits of hospice that you get. Uh, you get medical equipment such as hospital grade beds, walkers, uh, oxygen, things like that. You get medications related to the terminal illness as well as supplies. And generally if you have Medicare and Medicaid, this is all covered. So everything that I went over including the team is 100% covered. And this is usually the case for most insurance as well. So now that you're well versed in what hospice is, let's talk about how to choose hospice for advanced dementia. And the most important thing is making sure an agency does have advanced dementia knowledge and has a lot of experience caring for these individuals. Because there's a unique set of needs and skills required to care for a patient with dementia and Alzheimer's compared to, let's say, a patient with cancer. The other thing you want to consider is response times. And um, that basically is, is how quick or immediate can an, agent, can an agency respond to an emergency? Um, and of course, this is absolutely the case in hospice. Now I can speak to our agency where this is important to us since we are local. So we will not take a patient we cannot serve. Whereas other agencies, uh, perhaps that are larger, may go ahead and say yes to a patient um, and, and being able to staff that area may be a secondary consideration. I mentioned the team is extremely important. So um, it's very important that they're knowledgeable in advanced dementia and also very personable. Also worth mentioning is the leadership of a company. Now again, I'm biased and I can only speak for our company, which is family owned. And we have had personal experience with family members who have passed and have been on hospice. So that's where we started from. That's where our care comes from. And this is extremely important to mention and is often overlooked because leadership is what's going to choose and instill values and missions of that company. And so they'll choose team members that align with that mission. And so this all trickles down to just the level of care provided to the patient and the family. And last but not least, I wanted to mention that you have a choice. Oftentimes you will get recommendations from a facility, a physician, or a hospital to an agency they're familiar with or have ties to. So do know that you have a choice. And this choice can happen at the beginning, beginning and it can also happen in the middle. And it's really sad when I hear this, but if you're not happy with an agency, you are always able to transfer to another agency. And I hope this never happens um, but if it does do not this is not a time for you to settle or to get subpar care so don't hesitate to research and know you have a choice to switch companies because you need that excellent care that you really deserve for yourself and your family member so this really concludes my presentation and so i wanted to summarize all that we went over and we started with realizing that dementia is tricky in the sense that it's difficult to see what's happening to the body. Now we of course know that it affects the brain, but sometimes it's not always easy to see how much the body is affected. And I really commend all of you for coming to events like this symposium and building your understanding and educating yourself on what advanced dementia and Alzheimer's is what it can lead to, and knowing that it is a terminal illness and how it can present itself and therefore what care options you have at this stage. It's important to know and understand these things, so should you want to be in a position where you respond through hospitalization, or is it a time to learn a little bit more about hospice and what role it can maybe benefit you and your loved one? So by arming yourself with this knowledge, which again I commend you all, um, because then you can really choose the best route for yourself and your loved one. 
And I know that's why all of you are really here today. So I really appreciate the time that you've given to listen to me and Nicole. So thank you again, and I am here for any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. lot of people into our office and they say, look, I want to plan for the future, but I don't know what I need. And so what we tell people is there are five critical documents that everybody needs. Now there's some, there's some other ones that you can get if you want to achieve certain objectives. Uh, but the five basic ones that we tell people start off, of course, with a last will and testament. And most people, when we say a last will and testament, they, they, they're familiar with that. They know what it does. But what's crucial about having a will in place is that um, when you die, if you don't have a will in place, the government has one for you. Uh, there are laws that deal with if a person dies without a will. It's called dying intestate is the word that they use. And there are laws that deal with if you die intestate, here's how your property is going to be divided. And that's not always what people want. Um, so if you have a will that clarifies how you want your property divided, who you want to be in charge of making sure that it's divided properly, questions like that, then that's what's addressed in a will. Um, the second document that we tell people that you need is a, it's called a statutory durable power of attorney. Some people refer to it as a financial power of attorney as well. And what that does as while you're living, it allows you to name who you want to be in charge of your money in the event that you were in some type of a condition where you no longer manage your own money. Um, sometimes that's by choice. We have clients who come in who say, look, I, my, my daughter or my son, they're paying the bills and handling all that for me now. Other people, uh, it's more a matter of they, they just don't have the energy for it. And in some cases, uh, we have people who've been diagnosed with some type of cognitive impairment like dementia or Alzheimer's. And so the doctors are telling them, you need to get this signed while you're still clear headed enough to legally do it. So, uh, so that's the, the, it's called a statutory durable power of attorney. Uh, kind of cousin to that is something called a medical power of attorney. That is a separate document that allows you to designate who you want making your medical decisions for you in the event that you're ever unable to do so, whether temporarily or permanently. So the medical power of attorney and the durable power of attorney work hand in hand um, because they deal with both your property and your, your health. So the reason that I kind of talk about those two at the same time is because there is a consequence and it's not a good consequence if you don't have those two documents in place while you're living. And that is if somebody were to, let's say, have a stroke or some type of a, a very significant health event where they went from healthy, you know, one day to not the next and they couldn't manage their affairs, the only other legal recourse uh, out there would be to seek a guardianship. And guardianship is a very big deal. Um, it takes a long time to get through the courts. Uh, it involves not only your guardianship attorney, but also what's called an ad litem attorney that's appointed by the court. It involves multiple court hearings. Um, it can take a year, a year and a half sometimes to finalize all of that. And then, uh, and, and the, of course, you're, you're paying your attorney all this time. Uh, guardianships are, are considered to be fairly expensive. Um, I'm not a guardianship attorney, but I've talked to guardianship attorneys that I know, and they said, you're probably looking at twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, somewhere in that range to do a guardianship. And then after you get the guardianship, um, if you want to manage that person's finances or their health, you have to make an appointment with the court and go see the judge, tell the judge what you want to do, um, get, your, uh, get your attorney, of course, there, and you're paying your attorney's fees and all that. So it, it kind of becomes this lifelong 
uh, as long as the person is living with a guardianship of going back to court over and over and over again. So if you have the durable power of attorney and the medical power of attorney in place, it is 99% certain you'll never have to seek guardianship. Nothing in law is ever 100%, but 99% sure. Um, so the fourth document that we tell people uh, that they need to have goes by several different names. Some people have heard it called a living will. Uh, I don't personally prefer that term because when you say a living will, people will get it confused with the last will and testament. Instead, we call it a physician's directive document. And the physician's directive is a document that lets you put down officially and in writing what your choice would be if you were ever being kept alive on life support by machines. Because if that scenario ever arrived, um, you know, the doctor would walk out into the waiting room to speak to your loved ones. And we don't want to have a scenario where the doctor says, so what, what does the family want? Because the family on the left side of the room might say, pull the plug. And the family on the right side of the room might say, leave it, leave it plugged in. And the people in the back say, I don't want to be involved and have that on my you know, decision list. So this is a document that lets you be the one to choose uh, if, when, and how that, uh, that scenario ever developed. What, what is it that you want? Because ultimately, it's your life, and it should be your legal decision. And you don't want to put your family in a situation where they have to make that decision. Um, so that's the fourth document. The fifth document is um, called a disposition of remains. And this deals with after you've died, after you've passed on, what do you want to have happen to your body? It's not a conversation that comes up over the dinner table much. Um, and so you don't want to pass on and then suddenly have your loved ones say, I have no idea what, what mom or dad here would want. We didn't talk about it. So that's a legal document that one appoints who you want to be legally in charge of your body so that there's no mistake who's calling the shots. And then second of all, you put on there what your wishes are. And that can include uh, obvious things like, do you wanna be buried or do you wanna be cremated? Um, do you wanna be, have your organs donated? Uh, it can also include things like, well, what about your funeral service or memorial service? Some people want them, some people don't. Uh, if you have a service, uh, do you want, flowers? Do you want music? You can be as specific as you want to with this document. So, um, so two of these documents deal with after you, you're, you're dead, your will and your disposition of remains. Two of the documents deal with, um, you know, when your health begins to fail, but you're still living. That's your two types of powers of attorney. And then there's the physician's directive, which is essentially you're being kept alive by machines. So, if you have those five documents done, uh, you're, you're pretty well covered for you know, most things that would come up. Like I said, there's, there's some other documents that we do for people from time to time, depending upon their specific situation. But those are, those are the five that we tell people. And we, at, at our office, because we wanna encourage people to get all of the documents that they need, we kind of bundle them up in a, you know, like a, what they call it a happy meal uh, of, of legal documents uh, so that we encourage people to uh, get all of the documents that they need. Um, so as long as I have a few minutes here extra, because I know VC's got to talk about Medicaid, so I've got to watch my clock. Um, I also want to mention uh, a, a couple of other documents that are a little bit next level beyond the original five. And the idea with the will uh, to do a probate here in Central Texas is not that bad. Uh, you hear stories from other states about probate being uh, really expensive, taking a long time. That's not the case here in, here in Travis Williamson County's um, probate process is fairly straightforward if you have a good will. And the time frame is in, a, in the range between three and four months usually. Now with COVID-19 and the courts being shut down, obviously that changed the rules temporarily, but uh, normally it's about a three or four month process. And uh, so there's nothing wrong with doing probate, but some people want to avoid probate if they can, 
uh, if for no other reason than they want to have uh, something passed to a loved one sooner than three or four months, not waiting on probate, uh, they may not want to, uh, probate is a public uh, event. People can go online and pull up the legal documents and find out things. So if you want to avoid that, one of the documents that nobody's ever heard of, and I usually, when I'm in a room full of people and I can, I can have everybody raise their hand and show me, I'll say, who in this audience has ever heard of something called a ladybird deed? And occasionally we get a, a hand that'll raise, but it's not really common. And ladybird deeds are one of my favorite documents because uh, there, there's two reasons that I bring them up. One, a ladybird deed allows you to transfer ownership of real estate to somebody of your choosing outside of the probate process. So many times we will have people come uh, into our office for help and we ask them about their assets and they say, well, I've got my house um, and I've got whatever's in their bank account or their investments, but that's, that's really it. There's nothing out of what we would consider out of the ordinary. And so they're hoping even though they have a will, once they get it in place, it's, it, the, that that's just a safety net, that they can actually transfer those assets without having to go through probate and wait and pay legal fees and everything. So the way that you transfer real estate outside of the probate process is with something called a ladybird deed. Um, about five years ago, the Texas legislature also created a sister to the Lady Bird deed, they call it a transfer on death deed. They're essentially the same thing. Lady Bird deeds came up through the court system. Somebody, somebody made a Lady Bird deed one time. It had to go through the courts to see if it would stand up. And uh, but it's been around since about the 1970s. Um, so the way a Lady Bird deed works is you have it drafted, and then you go file it in the county where this real estate is, and it remains there on file. And when you die, one of your loved ones will take your death certificate down to the county clerk's office, say, hi, we have a ladybird deed on file. They'll check it. And as soon as they have confirmed that, they will go into their computer and change the ownership right then and there without the need for anybody going to court or waiting or doing probate. Uh, the other part about a ladybird deed that is so crucial, and this is a good segue to what VC is going to be talking about with Medicaid. In the Medicaid process, Medicaid will tell you that it is okay to own a home and get on Medicaid. That's fine, your home is an exempt asset. Uh, Medicaid has asset requirements and I'll, I'll let VC talk about all of that, but Medicaid will tell you that it's okay to have a home and get on Medicaid. What's kind of buried in the fine print is that if you own a home and you get on Medicaid, and then you're on Medicaid for however many years and then you pass away and they go to probate your estate, to probate your will. Medicaid will show up at court with a list of everything that they paid for you while you were on Medicaid. And they will put a lien against that real estate for that amount and they will get it. Uh, it's really, really hard to fight at that point. However, a ladybird deed defeats all of that. A ladybird deed removes the real estate from your estate long before you would ever get to court. So Medicaid has nothing to attach their lien to. So uh, anytime somebody comes to us and they're talking about, hey, I need um, myself or my, my loved one needs to get onto Medicaid, one of our first questions is, do you own real estate? Do you have a house? And if so, we want to make sure to make the necessary arrangements so that upon your death, uh, your house is not sitting there for Medicaid to go put a lien against. Uh, there was a, a friend of our family who came and told me a story, something that happened in her family. Um, her, she had a relative who this exact scenario uh, happened, and the lady who passed away had a house that was worth uh, $325,000, I think it was, and she had intended for upon her death for this house to be sold and for the money to be split between her two sons. So, you know, the, the math on that is, you know, it's over 150, dollars 
that each of the sons was supposed to get. Because they didn't know about ladybird deeds, Medicaid came in and put a lien against the house for $140,000. So this $325,000 house that she thought she was leaving to her two sons was now subtract $140,000 from that. So her sons got significantly less out of that. And all of that could have been defeated and, and avoided if she would have known about Lady Bird deeds. So that's, I, I, I stretched it. I, you know, I'm supposed to talk about the five documents everybody needs. Not everybody needs a Lady Bird deed, but it's such a wonderful document that I, when I have time, I like to throw it in there uh, because most times people don't know what they don't know. And it, the more we can tell people, the more we can help them. I'm an occupational therapy and driving rehab specialist, and this presentation was created for the Alzheimer's Texas Association. I have about 25 years experience with a variety of special needs populations and started driving rehabilitation services with adults in 2001. I am an occupational therapist, but my specialty has been serving um, persons with mostly invisible differences and addressing the needs of those in our community who have needs that tend to fall through various service gaps with regard to health care coverage, um, state funding support, and educational support. I am a driving rehab specialist with enough hours for certification and I have specialty training to the highest level through AOTA for addressing senior driving needs. I work at St. David's Adaptive Driving Program, and I also have a mobile services called Safe Driving Rehab. Uh, finally, I work for a rehab without walls type facility called Learning Services, and also work with persons with spinal cord injuries and traumatic brain injuries through the home base and community settings around Central Texas. There are some pros and cons of getting services at various locations. Um, one pro is that I believe that St. David's may take Medicare because they're a hospital, but the problem is that Medicare does not consider driving a medical necessity. So the risk with getting services at St. David's would be if there was a um, a review by the insurance of the services being provided and they saw that it was for driving, then those services could be denied and then the bill would be forwarded to the client. Um, the evaluation at St. David's is a little bit over $1,200. The pro of safe driving rehab is that because it's a mobile provider, I can come to the client. I also have more flexibility with sort of the rules that I can follow. So since I'm not a hospital, I have a lot more flexibility in what I can do. One of those being that I can come to a person's home. I can also do a road test in their own environment. And I can provide regular driving lessons that I don't feel as occupational therapy. So this gets into a little bit of cost versus price. Uh, the typical cost of a driving rehab specialist charge is going to be between 125 and 200 an hour. Um, my driving rehab fee is 125 an hour. Um, and then I also have a non-direct charge, which is $60 an hour. That's for things like paperwork or travel um, or anything that's non-direct, like communication with other team members. The $60 an hour fee I also charge when there is a client that I need to see who has a financial barrier, um, meaning they can't use insurance and they don't have enough funds to cover the occupational therapy services. If that's the case, then I can offer them a driver's screening and uh, one or two lessons if appropriate. This is an option I'd like to discuss with the client and family and make sure it's the best option for them before we start to decide which route to go. One con is that I have a Toyota Camry. So if someone 
uh, needed to use a van, they would have to go through uh, agencies such as St. David's Rehab. With the COVID-19 precautions, I have a lot more flexibility than the hospital does, and I just, just use common sense precautions. So I ask the client family if they feel comfortable with me coming into the home, uh, or if they prefer a screening or assessment in some other type of setting like the hospital and clinic that they're at. At this time, I don't feel like it's best that I would go into a nursing home just in case there's a possibility that I have been exposed to anything. Um, but I do use an adequate sort of association of driver rehab specialist guidelines in um, cleaning protocols for uh, when I'm using clients in my car and materials. If you need to reach me, I've listed my cell phone number. It's 512 689 0236. Or you can contact me through the website, which is the safe driving rehab.com. I'm going to get a little bit more into uh, talking about driving with Alzheimer's in the next few slides. With aging and progressive nature conditions, such as dementia or Alzheimer's, it's not a question of if someone can continue to drive, but when they need to retire or cease driving. Right now, because of the baby boomer population, which is aging, there will be an estimated over, um, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in need of sort of assistance in transitioning from driving to other community mobility options. So it's really good to start planning ahead when it comes to those things. Losing a driver license or driving ability can be quite an emotional topic for anyone and it's best to try to begin that conversation when someone understands uh, the limitations that they're facing and can start being involved in the decision making and planning process to feel some sort of pride and personal independence in that decision. Oftentimes I get referrals when it's almost too late and I have to be sort of the bad guy and be the one to take away someone's driving privilege. And that's always a really difficult conversation to have. Um, one thing that I struggle with a little bit with the St. David's location is that we have such limited time to do the counseling portion and we don't really have the opportunity to follow up with regard to mobility and transition planning. That's one thing I like about the flexibility I have with my approach is I can schedule screenings and evaluations and counseling time um, that is basically, you know, doesn't force us to end a session at, uh, when we're having a difficult conversation. I can just have that flexibility to keep talking to someone feels like the issue is resolved. I also have the opportunity to be able to uh, come back and counsel and assist those individuals in becoming more independent in other, um, not only transportation mobility options, but independence in their activities of daily living, such as uh, continuing independence with um, social hobbies and shopping and things like that. One thing we know about limited community mobility is that it's directly related to a person's decline in total wellness. So we want to continue to try to enhance their ability to be mobile and social and active in the community as much as possible. I'm going to talk about a few models of practice that I use and uh, tools that I use when I'm assessing clients. One tool that I use is called the modem model. And what's really nice about this graphic is that it shows that the ultimate decision about driving is not just related to how someone performs on a cognitive assessment, but a lot of other components, such as client factors. Maybe someone is able to prove that they're safe to drive in a limited capacity because of the environment that they live in, and maybe their progress is sort of slow, so we could do ongoing assessments with them. Um, of course, I always have to take ethics into consideration and do what's not only best for the client, the client family, but also the general well-being of the whole community. I utilize informant data such as family report 
family goals, doctor report, and therapist report to help make a, a really informed decision about driving outcomes. And I also utilize a, a functional road test when appropriate. I say functional road test because uh, I don't think it's always fair that someone is tested in an unfamiliar setting in an environment completely opposite of what they live in. So my road tests are in the person's own community, and they have to prove that they're safe to be able to perform their daily uh, driving errands. Often with someone with dementia, the problem isn't necessarily their driving ability, but if their memory is impaired, what could happen if they got disoriented or lost or confused? So many times I think it's important to include a family observer when I do these road tests and I throw in something like an unexpected event or an emergency preparedness task and the family witnesses how the person is able to perform. If I said, for example, it looks like we have a hot tire, let's find a safe place to pull over and what should we do? I use a lot of different professional reasoning for my occupational therapy education to make the ultimate decision. And again, I'm always trying to support the safety and independence of the individual as well as the greater good. Another occupational therapy model that I utilize with my senior drivers is the OT Drive model. This is an acronym standing for Develop Readiness Intervention Verification Evaluation. And I've been heavily involved in the OT Drive projects. I don't know if you noticed, but my license plate says OT Drive, so I'm just a really big fan of this model. Um, it's very useful in making really sound um, decisions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the model on the next page. I've taken these images from an infographic from OT Drive, and what I like is at the top, I enlarge the horizontal spectrum showing how normal aging someone is sort of uh, likely to be a driver and low risk, but then over time with age, medical issues and increasing complexity from age and medical conditions or medications, that someone's risk in increases and their likelihood of being a safe driver declines so that eventually at some point it's appropriate to retire from driving and then cease driving and rely on other mobility options. What I like about the model is that the simple traffic signal tends to make sense to older people who are familiar with uh, this sort of green means go, red means stop, yellow means caution. So I use that when I'm explaining how maybe a tool from the clinician's guide to assessing older drivers, such as the trail making test, um, how that correlates to driving risk and uh, what it's looking at and how that relates to driving. I do find that many seniors are very angry at certain tests like the trail making test. They find it very frustrating when they're dealing, I think, with the grief of realizing that things are getting harder for them. And it's important that I uh, use a variety of information that makes sense to them. So ultimately, sometimes we go ahead and do a road test with someone, even that we know is probably not going to be able to drive or likely to be an at-risk driver, so that in the drive test, we can point out things that are happening and they can see for themselves why there's a problem. I've listed some other tools that I use. These are specialty tools. Uh, the OT Dora is a clinical assessment guide for older drivers. It entails several different subtests. The Workwood Drive Driving Assessment Battery is good for mild cognitive impairment and also is useful in helping create home programs to build certain types of attention and processing skills. The Cognitive Driver Assessment Battery is something I use when someone has sort of higher level functions and it helps find like little um, things that are hard to be found with other tests. All of my assessments include a vision sensory motor assessment um, following best practice 
And then I also use some road safety and judgment questions. Um, and then again, as stated earlier, my, my road tests and lessons, if they're appropriate, are always going to be community-based so that someone is driving in a familiar environment close to home and able to show me that they're safe to drive for their meeting their basic errands. It's often the case that uh, older drivers are able to resume driving for some period of time, but that their driving becomes more and more restricted. Hi, my name is Vicki Morris, and I am the uh, RN charge nurse for the QA meeting here at Rehab Living. I also work back here in the memory care unit at Cordell, and um, a lot of the things that we do back here is memory, um, trying to keep them oriented, and we do aromatherapy to help relax them and keep them calm so they're not on those antipsychotic medications, and then we also do a lot of memory um, music. Uh, we had some people donate some iPods and the activity director found out from the family what exactly um, their music they liked and what they grew up on and then we downloaded that music to those iPods and it has really helped with a lot of the behaviors. It helped keep them calm and relaxed during the day and help them remember and keep their cognitive intact. I'm Darlene Dossi, LVN. I'm the charge nurse at Rehab Living Unit 3. We're considered a secured unit because all our doors are secured. Uh, and we have a, a patio area outside. The residents have full access. They can walk around. They don't have to worry about getting lost. Um, no matter where they are, they're considered safe. Um, we do have their pictures uh, outside of their doors so that if they go wandering down the hall, they'll know which room they are in by finding their own picture. Um, they have different activities throughout the day. Uh, we do noodle ball to help with their uh, range of motion. We have uh, color bingo to help with their sensory. Um, we do laundry folding for the ones who need more dexterity, de dexterity in their hands. And we uh, do take them out on the patio for lemonade, popsicles, try to keep them hydrated that way. Uh, we've had a lot of education concerning dementia. We, uh, a couple years ago, they had someone come in and do a class called Untangling Dementia. And it discussed um, new ways of treating people with dementia uh, by reducing their psychotropic medications and focusing more on high doses of antidepressants. And then if the behaviors continue to a disruptive sense and it bothers the resident, then we can do low doses of Ativan and this tends to treat the dementia patient better without all the side effects of the psychotropic medications. Um, one of the things that um, sets us apart is I'm on a focus group now called Birkeland Current uh, out of Waco, Texas, and they develop software for people with dementia where their family members are trying to care for them at home. And uh, they've had some, uh, they're, they're like an electronic device that, that the family can have uh, placed like in the hem of their robe or a favorite purse that they carry. And it can track different things that the resident's doing every day. Uh, like if they're standing in one place too long, if the family member needs to send someone over to check on them. Or if they're entering an area for the a uh, family member knows that it's a dangerous area for them, or if they've fallen, it'll all alert the family. So they have me on a focus group for my input as far as um, some of the needs of uh, dementia people since I work with dementia. And I've been back here for about seven years, so I have a good idea of what their needs are throughout the day and what some of their dangerous you know, activities are through the day. And our focus back here is uh, to, first of all, keep these people safe, to keep them well nourished, and to keep them as high functioning as possible with the lowest dose of medications possible. And it takes a team effort to do it. Um, we have um, the charge nurse, we have an activity person, 
and then we have three CNAs so that we can provide uh, full care of the residents so we can keep them safe, happy, and active throughout the day.